Hello everyone. The topic of today's lecture is going to be multivariate regression models. Now, multivariate regression models are an extension of what we have covered last time when we talked about bivariate regression models. In the bivariate case, we had one independent variable and one dependent variable. In the case of multivariate regression, we are going to have one dependent variable but multiple independent variables. Topics that will be covered in today's lecture are going to be multicollinearity, dummy variables, natural logarithms, functional forms, and interaction terms. All those are concepts that are related to multivariate regression. As you remember, last time we talked about bivariate regression, where we had one dependent variable which we called y, and we had one independent variable x. In the case of the multivariate regression model, we still have only one dependent variable, but we now have multiple independent variables. Now, when we consider the univariate or the multivariate regression model, the objective is always the same, in the sense that even in the multivariate regression model, we are going to have an error term, and our goal is to minimize the sum of the squared error terms. Now, as you remember, last time, what we did, we had the independent variable on the horizontal axis, that was x. We had the dependent variable on the vertical axis, y. And we said that there is an error term that describes the distance between an individual observation and the regression equation, which we wrote as y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times x, where beta 0 was the intercept and beta 1 was the slope coefficient. Now assume that we are going to extend our model and we say that the home values this is an example we have looked at uh, last time, that home values, which we call y here, are a function not only of square footage, but also the number of bedrooms. Okay. Now, in this case, we can still represent the function graphically, but we would now be in the three-dimensional space, where we have the bedrooms on one axis, we have the square footage on the second axis, and we have the price of the home on the third axis. Okay, So that would be a three-dimensional space. Okay. Now, to illustrate how this would look like, let us consider two examples. Okay. So with two predictors, we are looking at not predicting a line, but we are actually describing a surface. And we are looking at the distance between the actual, actual observations and the surface itself. So it turns out that R has the possibility of interactive graphics, and I will be posting that code online. But what you can actually do is you can represent this three-dimensional problem graphically. Okay. It's a very simple code, and we are looking here at data about, uh, about eyes. Okay. So you can have this three-dimensional plot where the y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2 describes this uh, surface here. And the individual dots you see here are the observations. And the, we still have error terms that describe the distance between the observation and the actual play. Okay? Now, when you're going to execute this on your computer, you can actually see that you can draw or that you can rotate this plane to better visualize. And you see, as last time, you are going to have observations that are below the surface, and you're going to have observations that are above the surface. Okay? But you now have this in a three-dimensional space. Now, of course, when we are going to expand this model with 
multiple independent variables beyond two, then we cannot represent this graphically anymore because we are going to look at, at uh, in a multivariate space, okay, or multidimensional space. Now, the same assumptions that we have looked at in the bivariate regression model with a zero expected mean of the error terms, also the error terms being normally distributed, as well as homoscedasticity and a linear model, are still going to be valid for the multivariate regression model. Okay. Now, what will become an issue here, and in many cases it, in real real world data it is not that much of a problem if the model is correctly specified, is what is called multicollinearity. So for example, imagine you have a model where you include wealth and income as independent variables. In that case you may face the issue of multicollinearity because wealth and income are highly correlated with each other. And we will see in this lecture of why this may cause a problem. Remember that the purpose of the multivariate regression model, or of any regression model for that matter, is to establish causality between the independent variables and the dependent variable. Now it is very crucial to control for everything else that could influence your dependent variable. Now let us do an example why that is important. Suppose that you would like to know what explains the food bill of a household or of a particular person in a given month and you believe that this is a function of education. Now you can run a model that estimates the food bill as a function of the years of education the person has and there's a very likely chance that you are finding a significant relationship between or a statistically significant relationship between education and food bill. Now why may this be a problem? Is it really education that drives of how much a person spends on food or is it income? So if you were to include income and education in your model to explain the food expenditure of a person, what you would likely find is that the, it is actually the income of a person that drives the food bill and it is not education that drives the food bill. Of course, education and income may be highly correlated, which is the reason why you would find a statistically significant relationship if you only inc included education. Now, for a social science model, it is generally good practice that you consider your dependent variable, in this case, or suppose it is a home values, and you think about all the variables that can actually influence your home value. Now, in the case of a house, you will probably say that it is the square footage of the house, it is going to be the lot size that will influence the home value, bedrooms, bathrooms, characteristics such as hardwood floors or the number of garage spots and of course the location. Now if you set up a model like this and you execute the model and you find that for example the number of garage spots does not influence your dependent variable then you should not exclude this variable from your model but you should rather leave it in your model and say that garage spots are not a function our garage spots do not influence the home value. Okay? It is bad practice to think about a model, run the regression, and then simply look at which variables are statistically significant and just rerun the model with just those variables. Remember, the finding that, for example, garage spots are not statistically significant is a finding as well. Now, let us consider an example our first example with a multivariate regression model. What you will see is that everything you have learned for the bivariate regression model in terms of uh, how to implement it into, in R and RStudio applies directly to the multivariate, multivariate regression model. The same is also true for the interpretation of the, uh, for, of the coefficients. Now for this particular example we are going to look at a data set from North Carolina and we want to explain how the crime rate is explained by unemployment, population density, and high school dropout rate. Okay. So for this data, for this example, we are going to use the data set which is called Crime. It has 99 North Carolina counties, 
and you can see you have information about the population, the population density, the public school enrollment, the violent crime rate and unemployment. Now note in this case your dependent variable is going to be the violent crime rate and your independent variable is going to be public school enrollment, the unemployment rate and also the population density. Note that population density indirectly controls whether you are talking about an urban area or a rural area. So to estimate the model, you're going to write b hat equals lm, and we are going to have the violent crime rate. So you type violent crime rate tilde unemployment plus public school enrollment plus population density. And the data is going to be crime. So note that we have the dependent variable before the tilde and then we simply add all the independent variables after the tilde and we add them with a plus sign. So then as before in the bivariate model we are going to talk we are going to type summary b hat and we now have our first multivariate regression model and the output of it. Now the interpretation is the same as before. You are going to look at the stars in the last column here, which indicate you whether a variable is, or whether a particular variable is at least statistically significant at the 10% level. Now in this case we see that unemployment and also the population density are statistically significant at the 0.1% level in, and explain the crime rate in North Carolina. Note that the coefficients are also in the pointing also in the same direction or in the correct direction or what you would expect in the sense that you have a positive coefficient for unemployment which means that if the unemployment rate goes up so does the violent crime rate. So unemployment causes crime. The same is true if we are looking at the population density which means that the higher the population density the more uh, we are in an urban area that also the population density contributes positively to the violent crime rate. Okay? Now here it is of interest to see that the public school enrollment is not statistically significant at the 10% level, but it is barely outside the range of statistical significance at 10.7%. Note that you also have an adjusted R squared of 0.358, which means that almost 36% of the variation in the violent crime rate are explained by a variation in unemployment and the population density. Now you have the results from this regression model also in your slides. Now let us do a second example and in this example we are going to consider child mortality data from various countries. Child mortality is measured as the number of deaths per, per thousand births and we believe that or we hypothesize that this is related to the gross national product of a country, basically measuring the income and the wealth of a country and also the female literacy rate. We may have hypothesized that wealthier countries have lower child mortality rates and that country, countries with a higher female literacy rates also have lower child mortality rates. Okay. Now we have data that measures the child mortality rate and the variables of interest between 1985 and 1980, no, between 1980 and 1985. And note that the data also contains the total fertility rate. So let us consider the data here. And note that we have the data about child mortality in the data set called child mortality rate. 
where we have the where CM is child mortality, FLFP is the female literacy rate, PGNP is the uh, income, and TFR is the total fertility rate. So in this model, for this model we are going to say B hat equals LM, where LM is the linear model, and we have child mortality as the dependent variable, tilde, and then we have income plus the female literacy rate. And the data is child mortality. Then we say summary, b hat. And now we see that both variables which we included, the income as well as the female literacy rate, are statistically significant. Income is statistically significant at the 10% level, and female literacy rate is statistically significant at the 0.1% level. Note that both coefficients are negative, which means that the higher the, the higher the independent variable, income and female literacy rate in this case, the lower the child mortality. So note that the child mortality is measured in death per thousand birth. So if you want to interpret those, uh, those coefficients, you have to think about the scale of those numbers. Okay? So for example, in the case of, uh, of income, we have the coefficient of negative 0.005647. What this means is that an increase in income by a thousand dollars, let's write this here by one thousand dollars, then you multiply that by the coefficients, by the coefficient, that means that an increase in income in a country by a thousand dollars reduces the child mortality by 5.6 children per thousand birth. Okay. Note that, of course, you could also say that we have an increase in income by, say, one dollar. So instead of a thousand, we are just writing a dollar here that decreases the child mortality per thousand birth by 0 0.005647, which is a little bit more difficult to interpret than if we say that we are not looking at the dollar increase, but we are looking at a thousand dollar increase. Then the units become, uh, then the units make uh, more sense. Now, for the female literacy rate, the coefficient is a little bit easier to interpret because the female literacy rate is measured in percentage. It's a percentage term. So if the female literacy rate increases by 1%, then the child mortality decreases by, by 2.23 children per thousand birth. Now, what is important is that you can interpret those coefficients without actually knowing the actual level of the female literacy rate or the income in a country. All you have to know is that you have this coefficient and you can look at it as the rate of change. So if you change the female literacy rate or if you change the income, then your child mortality is going to be changing according to those coefficients. Since this is a linear model, you do not need to know what the current income is or what the current uh, female literacy rate is to say something about the effect of a change of those variables and how they are going to change the child mortality. Okay. Note that you have those results also in your slides and you have additional explanation of how to interpret the coefficients in your slides as well. Now, let us look at one more data set to explain the basic concepts of multivariate regression and assume that we have data about uh, the number of accidents as a function of temperature and precipitation. Note that those number 
numbers are made up and are simply a generic data set to illustrate the concept. So when we look at the data set, we have temperature, precipitation, and accidents. And how we would run the model is similar as before. We say b hat is equal to lm, where we say accidents, tilde, precipitation, plus temperature. And the data is accidents. And when we summary, when we use summary, we had, then again we see that in this case we would say that precipitation does not influence the number of accidents, but that the higher the temperature, the lower the number of accidents. And this would be statistically significant at the 1% level. Okay? Now, this concludes the first part of the lecture on multivariate regression. And in the next part of this lecture, we are going to look at special cases like multicollinearity, dummy variables, logarithmic forms, and quadratic terms. Okay, welcome back to this lecture of uh, multivariate regression. And the first topic that we are going to look at is what is called multicollinearity. Now, multicollinearity occurs if you have independent variables, and some of those independent variables are highly correlated with each other. Now, assume that you measure the home value based on the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and the square footage. Now, assume that every bedroom has one bathroom. Now, to illustrate this, let me write down the equation of how this would look like. So we have the price of the home, and this is a function of the square footage plus beta 2 times bedrooms plus beta 3 times bath. And now assume that each bedroom has a bathroom. So what this means is that bed equals bath. Okay. So then we could rewrite this equation as beta 0 plus beta 1 times the square footage plus beta 2 times bed plus beta 3. And now since bath equals bed, we can write bed. So if we rewrote this equation, what we would have is beta 0 plus beta 1 times the square footage plus beta 2 plus beta 3 times bed. So here you see that the regression model in this particular case is unable to differentiate between beta 2 and beta 3. Now, this is a case of perfect multicollinearity. This can actually cause problems in a regression model, even in the case of unperfect multicollinearity, in the sense that two variables are simply highly correlated. To illustrate this concept, let us look at the data set which is called teaching. Now, note that this data set is Modif is modified for the purposes of demonstrating this this issue. Okay, so don't think about this being uh, this being uh, reliable data. This is generic. Again, we have 99 counties, and we want to explain how the SAT score of high school students in a county, how it is explained by the income prevailing in the county, by the expenditure per student in the county and also by the ratio of faculty members to students in that county. Okay, So we run first a simple regression model where we say b hat is equal to SAT, where SAT is the dependent variable, and we say that the SAT score can be explained by income 
uh, and the expenditure per student. The data is teaching. And then when we say summary he had, we find that income as well as expenditure are statistically significant in explaining the SAT achievements of students. Okay. Now suppose that we are running a second model where we say B hat is equal to LM, where SAT again is the independent uh, is the dependent variable. We still include income, but now we also include the faculty to student ratio. Basically, this tells you if uh, if there are more if there are more faculty per student, then you are going to achieve higher SAT scores. When we summarize the data, again we see that both variables, income and faculty, explain the outcome of the SAT score. Because both variables are statistically significant, similar to the case where we had the statistical significance with expenditure. Now, if expenditure and faculty are statistically significant, if put separately into the model, we would expect that they are also statistically significant if we put them in together in a model. So we say faculty plus expenditure. But now we see that faculty is actually not statistically significant anymore, and that also expenditure is not as significant anymore, as statistically significant as before. Okay? Now, the reason here is that we have a case of multicollinearity, in the sense that faculty and expenditure are highly correlated. To see the correlation between the variables faculty and expenditure, you can type in plot teaching faculty, comma, teaching expenditure, and you can see that the variables are highly correlated, in the sense that the higher the expenditure, the higher the teacher to student ratio which is the reason why the results from our model are not reliable. Note that you have those results also in your slides under multicollinearity 1, where we have income and expenditure. Then in the second model, we are going to add faculty to the model. So we are replacing expenditure with faculty, and we see that we have statistical significance. But then when we include expenditure and faculty, that the statistical significance for one of them disappears and the statistical significance of the other is reduced. Okay. And here the reason is that you have multicollinearity. Now, an extremely important aspect of multivariate regression or any regression model is the possibility to include what are called dummy variables into the model. Dummy variables allow you to include a qualitative characteristic coded as 0, 1 into your regression model. You can think about this as, for example, religion, gender, nationality, and so on. If you think back about the model that we analyzed for the home value, we have here, we have hardwood floors. Okay, so this would indicate whether the home has hardwood floors. Hardwood floors here in this case is a qualitative characteristic of the house. Either the house has hardwood floors or the house does not have hardwood floors. So in this case, the presence of hardwood floor floors can be coded as a zero one variable. Okay. So this is one with if the answer is yes, so there are hardwood floors, and it is zero if there are no hardwood floors. Now, the inclusion of dummy variables 
Note that Domi variables are only on the independent side of the equation, is that we can simply include them into our model, in our, into our regression model. Right? Now, suppose that we have data about a vehicle and that we have uh, used car data where we have the price of a used car, we have the miles of the used car, and we also have information about the drive of the car in the sense that is it rear wheel drive or is it all wheel drive. Where all wheel drive in this case is the dummy variable which I call di that is either 0 or 1 and it only indicates whether a particular car has all wheel drive or not. Okay? Now let me illustrate how this is actually implemented in a model. So suppose that we have the price as a function of the miles of the car and whether the car has all-wheel drive or not. Okay. So note that all-wheel drive can be either 0 or 1. So all-wheel drive is 0 or 1. So suppose that we have a car that has no all-wheel drive and that means that all-wheel all drive is equal to 0. This means that the equation can be rewritten as beta 0 plus beta 1 times miles and since all-wheel drive is 0, B2, beta 2 times 0 is always 0, so the equation is only price equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times miles. If the car does have all-wheel drive, then AWD is equal to 1, and hence we have price is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times miles plus beta 2 and all wheel drive is 1 so it is only beta 2 or if you want to be correct it would be beta 2 times 1 which is only beta 2. So here you can see that we can rewrite this equation where we can say beta 0 plus beta 2 if you can think about this as the new intercept, plus beta 1 times miles. So we still have the same slope coefficient, but we now have this new intercept. Okay. Now we can still represent this graphically. So assume that we have the data about the that we have the data about the car. And we have price and we have Myers. Okay. Now suppose that we have two types of cars. We have with all-wheel drive, which I mark blue here, and we have the data, and we have cars without all-wheel drive, which I mark red, and so then we would have so with all-wheel drive and no all-wheel drive. So in this case, we would have a regression equation for the cars without all-wheel drive. And we have a regression equation for the cars with all-wheel drive. Okay. 
And note that they both have the same slope, okay, because beta 1 hasn't changed, so the slope is the same. So the effect of each additional mile on the, on the price of the car is the same. But we now have beta 0 and beta 1, which would represent the value of the all-wheel drive, is now this section here. where the entire line is beta 0 plus beta 1, which is what you have here, beta 0 plus beta 2, sorry. This is, this is beta 2. And also this is beta 2. Okay. So to implement this in R, we are going to look at the data set which is called BMW. So in the data set BMW, I have the miles of a used car, I have the price of the used car, and the last column called all-wheel drive measures with a dummy variable whether the car has all-wheel drive or not. Note that here we are talking about a car that has is the same model year, the same, the same make, the same model, same engine, everything is the same except that some of the models only have real real drive, where this is zero, and some, some of the cars have all-wheel drive. Okay. So if we want to implement this in R, we proceed as usual, we say b hat lm, and we say that it is the price tilde miles plus all wheel drive, and the data is BMW. And then if you say summary b hat. We now see that all three variables, all two variables are statistically significant. So here for miles, we see that for each additional mile driven, the value of the car decreases by 27 cents. And that the value of all wheel drive adds $3,429 to the value of the used car. Which means that if you have two identical cars with two identical mileages, then the car that has all-wheel drive is going to be valued at $3,429 higher than the car without all-wheel drive. So this is also the results you see here in the, on the slides. Now, at the beginning of this class, we have talked about the natural logarithms, and what we are going to cover next will highlight the importance of natural logarithms and Euler's number. Now, in this case, we have something that is called a log linear model. Okay. Now, assume that you have a model that is written as yi, which is the dependent variable, equals to beta 0 times xi to the power of beta 1 times the error term. Okay? Now, you can take the natural log on both sides of this model, and you now see that we have the natural log of the dependent variable equals an intercept plus beta 1 times the natural log of the independent variable times the error term. Now let me explain of how this change in variables, taking the natural log of the variable, how it actually changes the interpretation of the model and why it is useful. So consider the question where you want to know the, the quantities, the quantity 
of apples consumed <clears throat> as a function of the price of apples. And let us call the quantity of apples consumed Q, and let us call the price of apples P. Okay. Now what you could do, if you have data about the quantities of apples and the price of apples, you could estimate a simple linear regression model where you say the quantity of apples is a function of an intercept plus beta 1 times the price of apples, okay, plus an error term. So this is what we have, this is what we have, uh, this is what we have uh, seen so far. And if you estimate this model, what beta 1 is going to tell you is that for an increase in the price of apples, say by, by $1, how this is going to affect the quantity, the physical units of apples, okay? Uh, now, if we take the natural logarithm of this model on both sides. So we say instead of measuring Q in physical units of apples, we take the natural log and we say the natural log of apples is a function of beta 0 plus beta 1 times the natural log of the price of apples. If we estimate this model, then the interpretation of beta 1 is going to be in terms of elasticity. Now, what does this mean? Suppose that beta 1 is equal to 0.8 or the coefficient of beta 1 that you estimate is equal to 0.8, then this 0.8 is going to be interpreted as an elasticity, meaning that if the price of apples increases by 1%, not in dollars, but in percent, then the quantity of apples decreases. Actually, sorry, this would be negative. This would be negative point. This would be negative point eight. Okay. Then the quantity of apple decreases by negative 0.8 times 1% is equal to 0.8%. Okay, so now taking the natural log of both the dependent variable and the independent variable allows you to interpret the coefficient as a percentage change, or as an elasticity, which tells you something about the percentage change of the independent variable and what the percentage change in terms of the depend if the dependent variable is. Okay. So here in this table I have summarized the various possibilities. And note that so far we have only looked at the dependent variable and the independent variable being in what is called a level form, which means that we can interpret the beta coefficient as if the independent variable changes by x, how does the independent how does the dependent variable change? Okay, so for example, if the coefficient of beta is negative uh, 0.27, 
and we are looking at a model that estimates the mileage of a car and how it relates to the price of the car, then we would say that if the miles go up by one mile, or if the mileage of the car goes up by one mile, then the price of the dog, car decreases by, by 0.27 times one, dollar, uh, one mile. Here in the last row, we look at the case where both the dependent variable and the independent variable are in natural log form, and then we interpret the beta coefficient as a percentage. Note that a very common model also involves leaving the dependent variable in natural log form and the independent variable leaving in level terms. Okay. Now, in order to illustrate this concept, let us look at the housing data that I uploaded to Canvas. So when you look at the housing data, you have the price of the home, you have bedrooms, you have lot size, square footage, and whether the home is actually colonial in terms of style. Okay. So let us estimate a simple model where we say B hat is equal to LM, and here you can simply say log price tilde log lot size plus log of the square footage plus let's say bedrooms now note that bedrooms we do not leave uh, we do not transform into a natural log because for bedrooms to increase by say five percent doesn't make sense you either have one more bedroom or two more bedrooms. You do not have 5% more bedrooms, okay? So for each variable that you that you would transform into natural log form, you also have to think about whether it makes sense. And then we are also going to add the colonial. And the data is housing one. So then when we summarize the data, okay, what you can see now is that lot size and square footage are both statistically significant, and it turns out that uh, bedrooms and the colonial style are not. Okay? So how you would interpret this data now for the, say, the square footage, note that the square footage is point seven. Okay, or the coefficient associated with square footage is 0.7. So what this means is the following. If the coefficient is 0.7, that means if the is if the square footage goes up by 1%, then the home value increases by 0.7 times 1%, meaning by 0.7%. So this is what we have, this is how you would interpret this coefficient here. Okay. Now, let me, although bedrooms is not statistically significant, let me give you an example of why taking the natural log of the dependent variable, price in this case, makes sense in this particular model. So assume that you estimate the model a simple model, and we are talking about home prices, where you have price, and you simply say it is beta 0 plus beta 1 times bedrooms. Let's just call it beds. 
Okay, so you don't do not take the natural log of the variables. Okay? And suppose that beta one is equal to ten thousand. So what this means is that for each additional bedroom in the house, the home value increases by ten thousand dollars. Now let's assume that you take the natural log of price. And again, it doesn't make sense to take the natural log of beds, so you simply estimate the model beta 0 plus beta 1 times beds. And assume that beta 2 is now 0.1. Uh, sorry, beta 1. Assume that beta 1 is now 0.1. Now what this means is that if for an additional bedroom now this is interpreted as a percentage the home value increases by 10 percent Okay, so the home is valued 10% more with this additional bedroom. Now, why would this make more sense to estimate the natural log, to use the natural log instead of the price? Now, consider your data set where you have home values about, where you have home values and you have the bedrooms associated with those homes. And suppose you have home values that range from, say, $60,000 all the way to, say, um, $500,000. Okay, now take those two homes, okay, where you have this low value home and high value home. Now, if you estimate this above model, then what this model tells you is if you add an additional bedroom to home number one, the $60,000 home, then the home value goes up to $70,000. And if you do the same for the $500,000 home, then the home value goes up to $510,000, okay, for an additional bedroom. Now, does it really make sense that the additional bedroom has the same value for the low value home than for the high value home? I can argue that this is probably not the case, but that instead, if you are estimating the model below. What the additional bedroom would do is it would add for the low value home, it would add 10% to the value. So this house would go to $66,000 and that it would go to $550,000 for the high valued home. Okay, so here you have a difference in that this bedroom has a different impact for the low value home than the high value home in terms of dollar value, but the impact for percentage wise percentage wise is the same. Hence it would probably make more sense in this case to add the log of the price as the dependent variable. Right? Now in your model, so here if you're thinking about now ignore the fact that colonial is not statistically significant. Note that colonial here is a dummy variable that takes on the value of either 0 or 1. Now what this 5.3 would mean is that if this was statistically significant, this would mean that if you have a home that has a colonial character, that means it would increase the value by 5.38%, okay, compared to the identical home in terms of lot size, square footage, and bedrooms, of the non-colonial character. Now, the last topic topics that I want to cover are what are called quadratic terms, and they relate to the functional form of the equation, and also what are called interaction terms. Now, let me first explain the topic behind quadratic terms.
Suppose that you want to measure the effect of income on food expenditure. Oh. So you have the independent variable income and you have data on the food expenditure of households. Okay. Now with a linear model what you would do is you would run a regression equation and you would find a regression line that would look something like this. Okay? In the sense that the higher the income, the higher the expenditure on food of a household, which makes sense. Now the question is, if income increases, does it mean that for each dollar of income increase, the food expenditure is going to increase as well? Or are we going to, or is it more likely to have data that would look like this? We have an increase of food expenditure with income, but let's face it, at some point it's going to level off in the sense that you can only eat so much good food. Okay, so in reality we would not want to estimate a straight line, but we would want to estimate a line that goes, that levels off at some point. Okay? Now the first line here is what we would estimate if we had simply beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. Okay. Now if we want to include a curvature to estimate a non-linear relationship, we can actually rewrite the equation slightly by including what is called a quadratic term. So we would write y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x, and then we would add a quadratic term, I would say beta 2 times x squared. So in the case here, y would be equal to the food expenditure, and x would be equal to income. Okay. Now in this case, if you included a quadratic term, but you would expect to see is that beta 1 is going to be positive. If beta 1 is going to be positive we see this increase, but at some point beta 2 is going to have a dampening effect on the food expenditures and we would expect beta, C, beta 2 to be negative. Okay, And also, and we will see this in practice, to be very small. Okay, small, very small and negative. In that case, you would actually observe this curvature. Okay, now I have also illustrated this in the slides where we have this quadratic term, where we think about that the more education you get, the higher your wage is going to be, but at some point it is going to level off. Okay. Now, to include this quadratic term in the regression equation, we have to include a term called i, and then experience squared. Now, it is extremely important to realize that, unfortunately, with r, you cannot simply say experience squared, but you have to use this i, parenthesis open, the squared term, parenthesis closed. Okay, otherwise it is not going to work. Also note that every time you include a quadratic term into your regression equation, you should have a very good explanation of why you do so. Okay, you cannot simply add a, a quadratic terms into your regression equation without a justification of why you're doing so. In many cases, age, experience, tenure, things that uh, that level off over time are good candidates to include as a squared variable in your regression equation. So to implement this in R, we are going to look at the data in wage, where you have the income, the education of the person, and also the experience experience, think about this, of how long they have worked in this particular position. So what we do is we say b hat 
equals LM income tilde education plus experience plus I experience squared and the data is wage. And then when we summarize the data, we now see that education has a positive effect on the wage. So does the experience of the worker. But note that the experience is increasing, but it is flattening off over time in the sense that the more experience you get in the early stages has a bigger effect on, the, on your wage than the experience you get on the, in the later stages. So what this means is that, say, if, you have, if you're adding five years of experience right at the beginning, those five years are going to have a bigger effect on, the, on your wage than adding five years when you are already having a lot of experience. Those five years when you already have a lot of experience are only going to add a little bit in terms of wage. Now a concept which is closely related to the quadratic term is what is called an interaction term. Okay. Now the interaction term is slightly more complicated to explain what it means. So imagine that you're looking at salary data of graduates, their income. And suppose that it is, and suppose that you assume that this is a function of schooling or the years of schooling they had. And also assume that the income depends not only on the years of schooling they had, but it also depends on a measure of the parental education. Okay. So here you can think about the story that if you have two children and they both are identical in terms of how many schooling years they had, that perhaps the person who had who has the parents that are that have more education perhaps has benefited more from the uh, has benefited more and hence has a higher income because the parental education actually or the education of the parents actually made them pay more attention to what is going on in school etc which then has an effect on income Note that I can also relate this model to the current situation of school closures, closures during the COVID-19 pandemic, that there is already concern that children that are schooled at home, since all the schools are closed, that children that are in households where the parents, where this, where the parents are well educated, that they are going to have fewer troubles later on than in households where parents are less educated, okay? And we will probably see a lot of research analyzing those effects in the years to come, okay? Now, what this model says is that an additional year of schooling for a particular student has, say, a hundred dollar increase, results in, say, a hundred dollar, uh, say, a thousand dollar increase in monthly salary, okay? and that parental education may have an increase of, say, I don't know, $50, okay? Now, what this means is that if you have two identical students, that independent of the parental education, that an additional year of schooling has the same $1,000 effect on the income of the student, okay? Now, what the interaction term is going to do is to say that an additional year of schooling for both students, despite the fact that their parents' education is different, does not have the same effect in terms of income. 
but that the additional year of schooling actually depends on the parental education, the level of parental education. So if we estimated a model with an interaction term, we would say beta 0 is plus beta 1 times schooling plus beta 2 times parental education and now we would include the interaction term by saying beta 3 is schooling times parental education Now, if you rewrite this equation, you would have beta 0 plus beta 1 beta 2 times the parental education and now we are going to rewrite this slightly by saying this is beta 1 plus beta 3 times parental education times schooling. Okay. Now, you can interpret this as the new slope associated with schooling. Now in the previous model this slope was constant. In the previous model this slope of an additional year of schooling was simply beta 1. Now in the new model with the interaction term the slope associated with schooling is not constant anymore. But the slope depends on the parental education. What this means is that if beta 3 is positive, which most likely it would be in, uh, in, uh, in, in reality, is that if the parental education is higher, so if you have two students and one student has parents with a higher education, then that student is going to benefit more from one year of schooling than the student whose parents are not as well educated. Okay, so the interaction term is to change the slope associated with a coefficient. Okay, meaning that the slope varies, or the effect of one variable varies depending on the level of the other variable. Okay, that's what education, uh, that is what an interaction term is. And to illustrate this concept, we are going to look at the dataset wage 2. Note that here you have the wage of the person, you have the education of the person, the experience of the person, age of the person, and you also have the education of the parents. You have You have mother's education and you have father's education. Okay, so for our purposes, what we are going to do is we are going to add those terms and simply call them parental education. So how you are going to do this is as follows. First of all, in wage two, you create this new variable, which we call parental education. And we say it is the mother's education plus the father's education. Okay, and then we are going to estimate a model where we are going to say b hat is equal to ln the log of wage. plus, uh, sorry, the, um, 
tell them the education plus experience plus tenure. But now we add an interaction term between education and parental education. And again, and this is very important, we have to use the I. And we have to say education times parental education. And the data is wage 2. And we summarize the data. Now what we see is the following. First of all, note that all the coefficients, all the variables are statistically significant. That the more education, the more experience, the longer the tenure with the current company is, the higher your salary is. Okay. So here note that since we have the dependent variable in the form of natural log, that we interpret this as a percentage increase. Okay. So that a percentage increase, that an additional year of education increases your salary by 4.6%. But now note that your education, the increase, the returns you get on education, also depends on your parental education. Okay? So if you have two people that are identical, and you have, except that one person has parents with low education and the other has parents with high education, then the person with the parents that have high education or more years of education, that an additional year of, uh, of education of the person itself has a higher effect on for the person where the parents are, have more years of education. Okay. So this concludes the lecture on multivariate regression. And the next lecture is going to be about by uh, about binary choice models.